tonight on Greater Boston. I'm Sue O'Connell in for Jim Browdy. And ahead, I'll be joined by two leaders at a Dorchester nonprofit with a unique model for tackling community violence by providing support and mental health services for gang related youth. Then, the retirement of Maddie in the Morning's Matt Siegel from KISS 108 after 41 years behind the mic. It marks a major change in the Boston area radio landscape. Another area radio star, the great Oedipus, he joins me on that. While homicides and shootings have been on the rise throughout much of the country since the pandemic began, in Boston, those rates have been falling. But there's still obviously a lot of work to be done because even one shooting or death is one too many with each ripping apart families and communities. That's why for the past several years, the Dorchester-based nonprofit Uncornered has worked to stop those cycles of violence by reaching out directly to current and former gang members and at-risk youth, among others, to provide them with mentorship and other support. Among the services offered more recently, mental health. In the fall of 2020, Boston Uncornered hired its first director of mental health support, Eleanor Forbes, who joins me now along with Mark Culleton, co-founder and CEO of Boston Uncornered. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining me, Mark. I want to start with you because, you know, it, it doesn't seem like a big stretch to me to make a connection between mental health and, and solid mental health and a safe community when you're talking about mental health and reducing violence, what are you talking about? Oh, well, there's just so much trauma that when leads to actions that create cycles of violence in our community. And uh, when you're engaged with this small percentage of the population that's engaged in gang violence, mm -hmm. it's 2% of the population responsible for 75% of that crime. There's a lot of trauma, both uh, existing, pre-existing trauma and new trauma that comes with the violence that's seen in our communities. And so getting to the root of that and having a way to support our staff to then support the young people who are active in gangs is critical to their being able to think differently about their lives and choices and future. Eleanor, I, I think that prior to, to COVID, um, you know, most Americans have always thought of mental health as something that's over here, right? You know, our bodies are over here and mental health is, is over here. And obviously, it, mental health advocates don't like it when you draw a line between mental health and, and violence. But the reality is we all are struggling with mental health in one way or another. And unfortunately, for some, sometimes violence is an outcome of that. Can you talk about what some of the factors are that impact someone's mental health? Well, for the population that we work with at Boston on Corner, I would just basically say the thing that impacts them the most is the trauma from their childhood. Um, something that, you know, in a lot of um, these disparities in neighborhoods, poverty, um, absent parents, parents um, with substance abuse issues, um, actually make a lot of our children actually turn towards looking for a family. And the uh, gang violence, the gangs are out there open, ready to receive them. And we don't realize that there's kids who are um, didn't eat, you know, need a way to be able to figure out how to provide for themselves because they don't have, you know, the necessary skills um, to do so because they haven't been taught. And so these are a lot of the things that really lead to our children and the population we have in Uncornered. Um, we look at their trauma and it's a huge trauma history. Mark, before we get into um, some of the details of, of what you're doing in the mental health space, talk to me and tell our viewers a little bit about what Boston Uncornered, uh, Uncornered does just in general. Uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. It's the idea that we can only truly unlock the potential of Boston by ending gang violence, ending street violence. And we can own that, only do that by actively engaging active gang members uh, and getting them to think differently and act differently. And we do that by hiring formerly gang involved individuals from particular neighborhoods and crews, uh, trusting them to engage the most active influential members of any particular set. Um, and then, meeting them, expecting greatness of them through the path from corner to college and providing them an opportunity to make different choices through a direct stipend 
Um, all of these evidence-based practices that work incredibly well, and we just provide the scaffold. And what's become increasingly clear time after time is you can't do any of that until you've dealt with your underlying mental health issues um, that get in the way of so many, um, uh, so much of the ability to take advantage of opportunities in front of you. Eleanor, Eleanor, talk to us a little bit about the ways that this, this mental health intervention would work uh, specifically with, with this community and this constituency. Um, well, what we've done is that uncornered is we found an unconventional way to do mental health, because as you talked about previously, it's been such a stigma in our community. And when you say mental health, everyone wants to say that there's nothing wrong. However, we figured that we just take everyone's daily life skills to kind to, to help them understand that there are mental health issues and there are mental health challenges, but we look at the lagging skills and we worked up long with the, the tool called collaborative um, problem solving with um, Stuart Ablon from Mass General. And so we use this tool to really look at with all of our ex um, gang members that you know come to us and the ones who are still involved. Um, we just say, what is your lagging skills in communication? Tell us how you communicate with people. What are your lagging skills in attention, work, and memory, cognitive flexibility, um, social, emotional skills, and even social thinking? And, you know, we just make scenarios to make them laugh, to kind of feel like, you know, okay, where's, where's this lady going? And so I always tell people the uh, pancake joke, and um, the pancake joke is that, um, when your spouse or your partner makes pancakes and you know you like those round, fluffy pancakes, I said, is it easy, medium, or hard for you to tell them, these are not the pancakes that I like? <laughs> and when the, the CRA say, oh, nope, not in my house, it's hard. Or, you know, the student said, oh, no, we can't have that conversation. I said, so that's hard for you. Well, let's talk about, as we work, we're going to talk about how that will get easier. How can you communicate to say how you feel about those can pancakes? And how can you help the other person that you're talking to understand your feelings and different things like that? And when we do that, they all sign up. They say, well, I want to do this, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you didn't know this was therapy? They was like, no. <laughs> so um, this has been the uh, big thing about our success um, with um, these ex-gang members that we hire. And those who are even coming in, they feel like this is a fun way to do therapy without feeling like that there's something really wrong. Yeah, and Eleanor, I, you know, I have to say, uh in my own personal life, I know that you just don't do uh, an intervention or a treatment with a, an individual. It's usually the family that's involved. I was recently informed that me being snarky about how no one's paying attention to me is not a way to actually communicate appropriately to get what I need. I'm going right. to maybe go back to the pancakes and see if I can, <laughs> I can work on that because I'm not sure if I yeah. can change at this point. But how are you working with the folks around the people you're working with, with their families and with the communities? Because many of these folks, they've lived here for generations. They don't want to move. They don't want to get out of their neighborhoods. They want to stay in their communities. How are you working with the whole thing? Well, I always say unconditional po positive regard, like Carl Rogers. You have to walk into all these family settings with authenticity. Um, the one thing that helps me with that is I'm a child of trauma. Um, I have a severe family history of trauma, absent father, um, mom with substance issues. Um, that was in her past. And um, seeing gang violence, um, I come from Philadelphia, came here to Boston and got uncornered. And um, and now the best thing about this is that um, working with um, this ex-gang population, even with my husband being an ex-gang member and serving time in prison, it has been so close to home that it's easy that when I'm doing it within my family, so it's been easy to transition and navigate my skills to be able to work with the other families that uncornered. Mark, lots of folks in the in the city are. I mean, we've we've been celebrating, in in some ways, our lower than other cities violence rates over the past couple of years. But as I said in the open, you know, any violence is is too much, and we are seeing an uptick in certain neighborhoods. Sometimes when we report these numbers, we're reporting yeah. the whole city, but we're not looking at neighborhoods like my neighborhood in Roxbury that you know has issues going on on a regular basis. What's your take on, on um, what's happening and how the police, especially in Boston, are responding and the community services responding to what folks are afraid may be a long, hot, and dangerous summer? Yeah, I think fundamentally we're doing uh, better than a lot of places, but we're not doing enough. Um, and the police has, have their jobs to do. Um, and 
that has been shown throughout the country that the police doing enforcement matters, but we need to invest heavily in prevention and engagement. Uh, we should be the first uncornered city in this country. By that, I mean we should end gang violence, street violence. We can. It's 175 shootings a year, about 50 homicides um, in this very small group. Uh, we know who they are, we know how to get to them, and they want to do something different. We need um, a universal commitment to get close to, to love, to believe in this population. And when you do, they change. And it's really the core belief is when they change, our communities thrive in a way that they've never been able to. So it's a call to action to let's get it done and let's get over that cliff. We've been We've been really successful, but we're stuck. Um, and that'll either go up or we can collectively decide we're committed to these young men and women, uh, these families, and we can get to zero. Eleanor, do you feel that there's been a shift? I mean, I know that we've, we've talked a lot of, about um, racial inequity and racial justice uh, issues with the police department, where the money is spent for police departments. but. I mean, I've been talking to police in my family and in my whole life who always say, we need more help dealing with issues that are beyond our scope. You know, I didn't just, you know, decide to become a police officer to become a social worker. We need mm -hmm. more help on that front. And, you know, even though it's still a hot topic, I feel like we've turned a corner and people are beginning to understand that an intervention with a family is a mm -hmm. step to make sure a crime doesn't get committed or that they become a victim of a crime and that it keeps police from having to deal with that. Are you feeling that as well, or is that just my, my crazy spring optimism that's, that's seeping in? I, I, would say, I would say half and half. I will believe that if we do get families involved, but first we have to have people become vulnerable. They have to be able to be vulnerable enough to ask for help. They have to be vulnerable enough to be able to say that there is an issue. Um, and right now, as the role that I play, it's really busy that parents are under a lot of stress, even with this pandemic. And, you know, in our communities, they're fearful. They're fearful to ask for help. And then even now, as we talk about with the disparities, there's not enough clinicians or help out there for those individuals, especially when people want someone who looks like them and understand them. And that's a big thing for us right now. We don't have, you know, the capacity to meet the need. And so, you know, I would just say definitely if parents get involved, Involved, if parents' eyes are open and they just, you know, find that confidence to be able to move beyond the guilt and the shame and to be able to say, you know, I'm going to ask somebody for help and to see where that leads me, that would just be the beginning step to, you know, helping us out. But it would definitely have an impact, as Mark said, on the work that we're doing because they can bring them to us and, you know, again, help them become uncornered, um, but know that there are resources out there for them. And mentor, you know, to, to mentee with people who are, have walked the walk that can help folks on the path. Mark, if, if folks want more information about Boston Uncornered, where can they go? Yeah, go to bostonuncornered.org. Uh, um, check us out, come visit, come see the great work that's being done. And as always, uh, if you want to donate, we'll take it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, we're, uh, we're excited about the work that's done, but we know that uh, any murder is too much, one too many. Thank you both for joining me, Eleanor Forbes and Mark Culleton from Boston Uncornered. I appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so Thanks so much, Sue. Thank you. Well, apparently there's only room for one seagull in the Boston radio market because a few short months after Paris Alston and Jeremy Siegel launched the new morning edition here on 89.7 GBH Radio, <laughs> Matt Siegel, better known to you as Maddie in the Morning, announced his retirement after 41 years at the helm of KISS 108's popular morning show. Siegel says he plans to focus on family and his new life as a mediocre golfer. But... Look at that's a major change for the Boston radio landscape and listeners who have reliably tuned into the show for decades. And joining me to discuss this is another iconic Boston radio personality, Massachusetts broadcaster's Hall of Famer, Oedipus, who had his own cult and cult-like following for decades on WBCN and now hosts the Oedipus Project website. Oedipus, what was your reaction when Maddie finally gave up the ghost and retired earlier this week? It's the end of an era. 
and not just Maddie Siegel's era, it's the end of the great radio personality on a music station in Boston. We have no more. He, he started pre-internet and continued from last century into this century. <laughs> and it's over. There are no more great music radio personalities on Boston radio. We have, we have radio personalities, but they're on talk, like Jim and Marjorie, for instance, or they're on sports. But music is all over. It's, it's amazing to me, you know, my daughter is 21 now, and she didn't really even start listening to the radio until she was 16, and she was just, just because we were in the car, and she was just appalled by how many commercials there were and how much talking there was. So she gets to, you know, curate her own music like everyone else does on Apple Playlist or Spotify, and then for personalities, she gets them from YouTube or Instagram or TikTok, and it seems like such a... A, a, a separation of music and personality as you're talking about, which I never thought was po possible. Is What does this mean? Is this good for music that it's kind of on its own and personalities over here? Or do you think we'll see a swing back someday? Well, it's great for music. For radio, it's not good at all. I mean, Maddie was successful because he was not only a great personality, he was funny, he was charming, he was your buddy. You got to know Maddie and you felt a, a kinship with him. We don't cultivate that talent any longer in radio. It's simply not done. It all changed with the Radio Communications Acts in 1996 when uh, companies could own more than one station. And they kept buying stations and buying stations. So they didn't cultivate and train the talent for the next morning show. I would imagine in the future, KISS 108 will have a syndicated morning show, probably out of New York, maybe out of LA. They just don't train people any longer overnights to be great DJs and then to take over the mornings. It's no longer happening. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to explain to folks who may not know, but you, you know, you would start as an intern, as I did, and then you would work the overnight shift or a weekend shift, and then if you were able to do that, you might move on to be a producer or work with a daytime personality, and then maybe if you were lucky, you'd, you'd get your own shift, and it would take off or not from there, but everybody of a certain generation had their favorites that they listened to. Um, you know, the other challenge, I, I, I've been saying to folks who've asked me that Maddie has been exactly the same since the day I met him, you know, in 1982. <laughs> there, it's not like he was a cranky old man. He was a cranky young man, and then he became a cranky old man. Um, do you think the dynamic of where we are with uh, immediate response and, you know, everyone's got a broadcast station on Twitter now, right? You have an opinion, you can just blast it out there. Do you think it made it more difficult for Maddie to be Maddie in the way that he was? Or do you think maybe he should have made an effort, I know he wouldn't be able to, but to change a little bit to adapt to the current uh, flow of how people react to you? Well, Maddie was Maddie. And he continued on Kiss What for 41 years and in radio for 45. He was at BCN for a while. And then he went off to television. <laughs> he tried to make it a television. Uh, <laughs> and then he just found his perfect, perfect spot at KISS 108. And he became a legend. And he is a legend. But those days are over. You can no longer work at a college radio station and then hope to be hired, like you said, overnight or part-time at a radio station and then uh, develop your talent. And then suddenly they'll say, hey, do you want to do morning drive? It's just not going to happen anymore. Not on not on music radio anymore. So what about radio? So let's so 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 Maddie's going to go on and continue to golf. I, I imagine we might see maybe a podcast or something from Maddie. He'll probably continue to do some <laughs> of his Wilbur Theater events because he loves to work. I mean, he's 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 a workhorse and and he's dedicated to it. Um, are are we just going to end up with? Um, radio that all sounds the same from market to market, from place to place. And what's the impact? How, how are audiences going to, how are our regions going to have our own distinct personality if radio sounds the same in Atlanta as it does in Boston? Well, it does. It sounds exactly the same. If you drive across country, you'll hear the same radio personalities. You hear the same songs on music radio over and over again. The personalities I mentioned are now on talk radio or sports radio. You don't hear it on music radio anymore. These companies control it. iHeart owns over a thousand radio stations. So it's just cost effective to have certain DJs just voice track and just pretend that they're in Atlanta or in Boston or New York 
or Chicago. Was there and anybody is, is there anybody like Maddie across the country? I know that there have been some some long running um, music DJs and personalities, but uh, he's he is a bit of a, a of a major legend in his longevity at one station in one morning show. There are some major personalities across the country, like Ryan Seacrest, for instance. However, what's great about Maddie is he was Boston. He was ours. He knew about Boston. He knew the streets. He knew how to pronounce the names of the cities. He knew all the players. And he had all the players on his radio station. I mean, he was just a terrific, terrific broadcaster. He was quick. He was funny. And he's going to be missed. But as I mentioned, this is it. It's over. We don't have that anymore. And they're not, it's not going to happen. The only hope that we have, you and I, Sue, is that eventually one of these radio stations will just not be generating the revenue. And once again, they'll let the inmates take over the asylum and run with it, just like they did with WBCN in the days of 1968. I mean, these people, they just had a passion for music. They had a passion for the culture. And they created a great, great radio station in 1968. And it lasted until 2009 when, once again, the suits decided, eh, we don't want to deal with this anymore. And music, we can just switch it all up and put a nice sports station on, which they did. And it's a great sports station, but we don't have that great music station, that culturally um, attractive station that, uh, that, that, is, that is Boston. Now, as you mentioned, it's all on the internet. You find it on the internet. It's all, it's so, there's only niches here and niches there and niches there, but. Do you, do you think there's gonna be a, a demand for it? I mean, this, this is the, 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 the thing that I think about on a regular basis is how small the world has become in that uh, you can access on almost any type of culture uh, from your couch, right? You can, if you want to listen to music in Switzerland, you can hear that. If you want to listen to a radio station in Ethiopia, you can almost access that. And it has it made our world tiny, which is great and wonderful for sharing ideas. But when it comes to some cultural identity, which has its good and bad sides, but when it comes to being proud from being from somewhere and having your culture, you know, besides sports teams, what are our touchstones to help us identify? You know, you could go on a trip somewhere and ma mention Oedipus or mention Maddie Siegel and people or mention, you know, Charles and people know immediately you're from, you're from Boston. What, what's going to be our cultural, artistic definition for ourselves now? Besides sports, it's politics. <laughs> we know the players in politics. You know, Elizabeth Warren, she's known across the country. She's known around the world. That's not as and much fun, though. I mean, that, 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 that's not nearly not as, as much, much fun. fun. I mean, it's fun for but, me, but it, you know, it isn't a great way to open a conversation at a tiki bar somewhere. Well, the internet changed it all, and especially with music. It, now uh, the means of distribution have dissolved. You, don't know, well, you no longer have to be on a major record label to have your music heard. So there's lots of opportunities to share your music across the world, and you can generate a fan base and a following. However, there's going to be very few superstars anymore. Very few people that can sell millions and millions and millions of records or have billions of streams. There are some, there are some, but it's not like it used to be where uh, there, was, there was an artist that you could name and everybody knew that artist. I think the last artist everybody knows would be Adele. Most people know who Adele is. Mm -hmm. Does everybody know who Doja Cat is? Does everybody know The Weeknd? Uh, we all know you too. We all know Rolling Stones. But think of all the new popular artists that many people have never heard of. So, are, and they're terrific. Are, are you taking a, is this a realistic view? Is this a pessimistic view? Is this an optimistic view? I mean, are you just sort of, uh, you know, looking out and saying, this is how it is and we're gonna have to deal with it? Or are you hoping that it turns into something um, a bit more magical than it feels like right now? This is the way it is, and it's not going to change. It's on, there, there are 60,000 songs uploaded on Spotify every day. Every day. Think about that. It's just we're going to have more and more music and more and more niches. And radio's in big trouble in terms of music radio because you can find this music everywhere. 
And at the top, there's no more requests. As soon as you hear a song anywhere, you can pull it right up on your, on your phone. Furthermore, uh, people's attentions, they might be playing video games, they might be watching a movie, they might be on their phones, they could be watching a series. So radio's in for a very difficult time because they have commercials. We're talking commercial radio here, of course. Yep. Um, because people aren't gonna sit through that anymore unless there's a major personality and the station is so dynamic, so exciting that you don't mind sitting through it at all. You didn't mind sitting through it because you wanna hear what Maddie had to say. You want to hear what Charles had to say. So you waded through the commercials, and sometimes the commercials were fun. We're talking about Charles La Laquadera, of course, and Maddie and Charles used to actually call each other from the radio stations from BCN and KISS when they were on together. I'm, my mind's a little blown when I think about if we could go back in time, uh, and as Maddie Siegel walked into BCN to, to start his, his radio career, we said to young Matt Siegel in the lobby, you know, in 41 years, you're you're going to retire, and it's going to be the end of an era. <laughs> you are going to be <laughs> on your tall yet slim shoulders. You are going to be carrying personality radio uh, off into the distance. Um, do Do you think Maddie? Have you talked to him? And do Do you think that he? I haven't understands? seen Maddie in a long time. I wish he'd uh, contact me and take me golfing. You can I'll beat really him. Apparently, him you can beat him. Is. So you've been golfing longer than he has. I think that you'll show him. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm certain that I'm not quite as good as he is. I know I'm not, but. Um, I mean, do you think that this that this is shocking to him that people are looking at this as an end of an era and it's not just Matt retiring? I think he's probably overwhelmed with the with the outpouring of love and what he's meant to this city. There's no doubt about that. I'm certain he's affected by that, but. It has to end sometime. And I'm glad he walked away and said, I'm just, I'm glad this is not a memorial. <laughs> Although he did ask me to give his eulogy, so I'm, I'm ready to do that. I don't know if he remembers, but maybe he can, uh, he'll, he'll make this. Well, Oedipus, I appreciate seeing you. I appreciate your wisdom on this. And uh, I look forward to, to, to spending more time with you in the future sometimes in uh, IRL, as the kids say. We've had some good times, Sue, and we're going to have more. <laughs> All right. I, I hope so. <laughs> That'll be another show. We'll do another, you know, Eddie and Sue, Susie, tell, tell the real tales. All right. Thanks so much for joining me, Oedipus. You're welcome. That's it for tonight. Come back tomorrow for the debate over medical aid in dying with a case before the state's highest court, multiple bills before the legislature, and a lot of strong feelings on all sides of the issue. That's tomorrow at 7. For now, thanks for watching and good night.